Welcome to Professor Messer's free CompTIA A Plus certification training course module on installing and troubleshooting computer power. I'm James Messer and I'll be your host through this module where we're going to talk about the requirements from our CompTIA A Plus certification exam 220-601 section 1.3 which talks about how we need to recognize and isolate issues with power. Also the 602 exam describes in section 1.2 how we need to know how to troubleshoot components especially power supplies and also in the 602 exam in section 1.3 we need to identify and apply common preventive maintenance techniques for personal computer components and we're going to talk today about those power supplies. So today we're going to go through quite a few different things. Uh, we're going to first talk about what tools you're going to need to troubleshoot power supplies. We're going to do some troubleshooting of power supplies. We're going to look at all different ways to plug in and look at how your power supply is performing. We're going to talk about power protection components especially UPS and search uh, protectors, surge suppressors, and how those are important. And we'll also talk about how we can upgrade or install a power supply in our computer system. Before we get started, remember that working with power is extremely dangerous. There's very few things you can do with the keyboard that are going to kill you with a computer. But when you start opening your system and you start looking at power supplies and troubleshooting and managing power supply systems, there is an absolute danger of fatality here. So you want to be very careful when working with power. If you aren't sure of exactly what you're doing or what you're touching, don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Power is very unforgiving when it comes to touching the wrong thing. And if you're ever looking at a power supply unit and you're thinking, well, we just lost a component in there, just fried out, let's open the power supply, take the case off of it, change out the internal components, put it back together. Not a good idea. Power supplies themselves are relatively inexpensive and it's much more safe for you just to throw out the entire thing and replace it with a new unit. And that's exactly when we're talking about working with power supplies, a very good way to do it. There are capacitors inside of there that are always keeping a charge at some level. So you want to be sure that you don't go inside that system at all and start poking anything into the power supply unit. Let's talk about what tools you would use to troubleshoot power supplies. Here's one that I have in my desk all the time. I carry this around whenever I'm not quite sure how the power is. If I ever go into a new facility, there's construction that's been done. Maybe we've put up some new cubes in a facility and we want to see if the power is wired correctly. This is a very easy way to do it. Very inexpensive little circuit tester. And you plug it into the outlet and it shows you via these lights, whether it is wired correctly, whether there's a ground that's not working properly, whether it's wired correctly. You can see I plugged in. I turned out the lights so we could see the lights that were turned on here. And if we get these two yellow lights on the right side, it is a correct wiring. And in my outlets on in my office, thank goodness, these are wired exactly the way we would want. So they are correctly wired. What does that mean, correctly wired? We'll go through that in just a moment as well. Another tool, one that you will find incredibly useful, not only for power supplies, but almost everything else that you're doing with PCs, is to have a very good multimeter. Just have a very decent multimeter there. This one happens to be digital. Sometimes it's nice to have the analog, and you can buy them for $10, $20, $30, and multimeters even go up into the thousands of dollars. But for what we're doing, I think this one from a uh, electronic supply company over the internet, I, I think it costs cost me about $20 or less. And you can see there's a lot of different connections. It's got these probes coming out, and that's what we're going to use to do our testing with. It shows us the voltages right on the screen. Very easy to use, very easy to see. In fact, if we look at the dial itself, you can see there's a lot of different options here for the multimeter. And it's nice, these multimeters, they come with manuals, and you can look through them. They explain what all these things mean. Some of these symbols we recognize already. If you looked at our previous module on power supplies and an overview of power supplies, we can see the DC symbols. We can see the AC symbols, very standardized when we're working with electricity. Very important that it's standardized so we know exactly what we're getting into when we start putting those probes into electrical systems. Let's start with troubleshooting outlets. And I'm going to say this again because it is pretty important. We want to be very careful when we're working with electricity. When working with a multimeter, one of the first rules is that you never touch those two leads of the multimeter together. You have a red and you have a black, and those should never touch each other. Make sure you're very cognizant of that whenever you're working with a multimeter. If you're ever not quite sure you're working with an outlet, you're not getting the things you would expect to see from a multimeter or your power supplies or anything dealing with electricity, just call a licensed electrician. They are very reasonable in cost and might save your life. So it's really important that you get an expert involved if you're never quite sure exactly what's going on with power. And I'll show you why that's important at the end of this presentation. 
here's a power outlet. You can see that we've got three different connections here in the United States. This power outlet's very similar around the world. These connections may look different, but they have similar functionality. Uh, this is a polarized plug. And we say that because one of these sides is a little bit bigger than the other. And you may have seen that the plugs you put into some of these have differently sized connections. So you can't plug them in the wrong way. This side that's a little bit larger on the left side is the neutral connection. This is the side that the power is flowing out of or flowing through. There's usually not a, a voltage on that particular connection certainly should not be. This is the line on the right side that is hot. This is the hot connection. It's always wired with a black cable to signify that it is a hot connection. So there is voltage on that. You don't want to touch that. It's very important. And finally, there's a grounded connection here at the bottom. And that's very useful for, for power protection, that we have that grounded connection that the voltage can flow into if there are ever any problems. There's also no voltages on that grounded connection either, ideally. But how would we know? How would we be sure what's going on? Well, we grab our multimeter. I've got my multimeter here set for my AC connection, my voltage in AC. And if you simply plug in the connection to the uh, in the neutral and the hot connections in your, just like you're plugging in any other type of device into the wall outlet, you should see the amount of AC voltage coming through here. So if you're wondering if in the, the building that you're in, if it's providing the right amount of voltage for you, large buildings have very different and complex power configurations. And if you want to be really sure, you can plug your multimeter in and see if you're getting the voltage you'd like to see. In the United, United States, we'd like to see 110 to 120 volts. So we're doing pretty good in that case. Now, we should also check the neutral and the ground connection. There should be no voltages on either of those. And if we plug in and look at those, and in my case, we got zero voltage coming across that, which is exactly what we would expect to see. You'll notice I've got one hand on these. What I'm actually doing is using one hand and taking a picture with the other. When you're working, make sure you use both hands to plug into these and make sure you keep those leads completely separated. Don't follow my particular view of this picture. And the ground to hot. We should, if we're plugging into hot connection and we're looking at the ground connection, we should be able to see that 120 volts would flow across that because that is a hot connection. This is one way to test and make sure before you start pulling off a connection and changing out an outlet, for instance, we want to be sure there's no voltages on any of these. And that's a good way to test across all three of those. So let's see about protecting power systems, these things that we're plugging into an outlet, how can we make sure that the power that we're using really doesn't cause any problems to the computer systems or other pieces of electronics that we're plugging into our outlets? Let's talk about surge suppressors. We'll also hear these called surge protectors. And these are devices that are designed to clean power from a connection from a power line coming out of the wall. And that's because very often there will be what we call these self-inflicted power spikes or these drops of power. If you've ever turned on a vacuum cleaner or you've started up a, a large air conditioning system or anything that pulls a lot of power, you notice sometimes the lights will dim. That's a very common way that a spike or a loss of power might happen inside of a system. And this will also happen if the power that's being provided to you from the power company, maybe there's a storm or they're shifting things around on the power grid. Occasionally, you get spikes and drops from those things as well. A surge suppressor is designed to even those out so that you don't have that kind of problem. If there is a spike or too much power coming in, it diverts the extra power onto the ground wire. And that's why these surge suppressors will always have that third connection there that uh, allows you to divert that power right into the ground connection. There's also noise filters in here. If you're ever sizing one of these or planning to purchase a surge suppressor, if you get a higher decibel level of filter, that's a better filtering in that surge suppressor. And that's why some of the surge suppressors, some only cost a little bit of money, some are a little more expensive. And that's because they have more outlets on them. They're able to clean the power better. Maybe the filters inside of them are a little bit better. And if you're ever looking to buy a surge suppressor, you'll want to look at a few things. One is the joule rating. This is how much it can absorb of a surge. If you get one that has 200 joules of rating, that's good. 400 is better. If you can find one that's got over 600 joules, that's really one of the best surge suppressors that you can buy. You'll also want to look for something that's a surge amp rating. The higher the amp rating, the better for your surge suppressors. And finally, there's a uh, Underwriters Laboratories 1449 standard that talks about a voltage let through let, let through rating. And there are ratings at 500, 400, and 330 volts. And ideally, you want to get a surge suppressor that is at least rated 
330 volts. And that's the, the lowest number that UL checks at, and it's a very good number. Make sure that if you're buying one, you try to get down there to that 330 volt number. The lower the number, the better the surge suppressor is going to be. If you've ever lived in an environment where the power is just not reliable at all, then you'll want to look into getting something like an uninterruptible power supply, or a UPS. A UPS provides you with backup power, gives you a way that you can have a constant power source. And what it has usually inside of it is a set of batteries. This is really good if you're in an environment that has a lot of blackouts, it has brownouts, which means the voltages will drop dramatically and, in essence, not be able to power the systems you happen to be using. And if you're doing a lot with computer systems, you want to be sure you save some of the, whatever you're working on. A UPS is a great thing to have. I live in Florida, and I always have my UPS plugged in because you never know when that thunderstorm is going to take out the power right from the the middle of what you're doing. And you don't want to be in the middle of creating a video and then have everything turn off. All the lights will go black. There's different kinds of UPSs. The very basic kind is a standby UPS, which waits for a certain amount of loss of power, and then it kicks in. One that's in the middle is called a line interactive UPS. As the power drips down, it will start getting a little bit stronger. So it's a little bit easier and works a little bit better than the standby UPS. And one of the best kinds of UPSs you can find is one that is always on. And it's constantly charging, and you're running from the batteries. And what happens is that when the power goes out, really nothing happens. You're always running from the battery system. You now just have to wait until the batteries run out until this UPS finally goes away. Usually there will be a noise or sound that occurs. You'll get a chirp or a beeping noise whenever the power goes off. Whenever you're looking to buy UPS, you may want to look for one that will shut down your system automatically. It plugs into your system via USB cable or a serial port. You want to look at the capacity of the system, how much battery backup it really has, how many outlets are happen to be on the UPS system, and maybe even one that has phone line or a cable television type connection in it so that it also provides suppression capabilities for those lines as well. It's very easy for power to come in through a phone line. So we've tested our power. We know how to check and troubleshoot our power connections. Now let's install a power supply inside of a computer system. Now the motherboard that we're using in a system, we want to be sure we match to the power supply. Everything needs to match perfectly. And so the motherboard power connection is going to be a very important one. Make sure that if you're buying a motherboard and you're putting one in new or you're replacing a power supply, that you replace it with one that's compatible with the motherboard that you're plugging into. You want to look at the system connectors that will be available to you. We talked about these in an earlier module, the four pin peripheral power connection, often called a Molex connector, and the one for a floppy drive. If you have a floppy drive in your system, you want to be sure you have that on your power supply as well. Here's a power supply. There's no motherboard in this system yet. All I have is a power supply, and I'm ready to install it. And the first thing you want to do is be sure that it is fastened in. So I put it into my case, and this is a power supply that's designed for this low profile server system. I put it in place and screwed it down, and then installed the motherboard. And what we've got is now our motherboard installed. You can see this long cable coming out of the power supply. That's our motherboard connection. There's a lot of other cables coming off to the side that plug into our hard drive, that plug into our floppy drives and our CD-ROM drives. But this is the big 20-pin connection for my motherboard. And so it goes all, in this case, all the way across my chassis here and plugs in the power supply for my motherboard happened to be completely on the other side of this particular motherboard system. And now it's plugged in. What I'd like to do is see, now that everything's plugged in, Am I really getting the 5 volt of standby power that I would expect to see? So let's do a test. Let's take our connections from our multimeter, and let's refer to exactly how our power supply is set up from the motherboard manufacturer. You can see here we know that there's a lot of ground connections, and that's where I'm going to plug my black connection into any of these grounds so it connects in with those systems. And I want to check the 5 volt standby power, which is on pin number 9. And so that's where I'm plugging in with this This purple wire is pin number 9. That's where my red connection, my red probe is plugging into from my multimeter. If you're very concerned about plugging things in where the power is on, unplug the power, plug those connectors in there, get them nice and tight, and then plug the power supply in. So a couple times, maybe the first couple times through, you may want to make sure that everything's in there well before you apply power to the entire system. That's a good way to do it. Here's a tighter shot of that so you can see what's going on. And what we really do is just 
very snugly putting our probe right in there into that connection. There's plenty of room. There's a little metal connection coming up off of that connector. And that's what we're touching is the metal connector on the end of that wire. And all we have to do is just touch it a little bit with that probe. And they fit in there nice and snug. So if we plug into those connections and we look at our multimeter, sure enough, I haven't even turned on the motherboard at this point. We've just plugged it into the wall and I've confirmed that indeed five volts of power are connected to the system and are hot on this motherboard through that standby connection. When you want to start troubleshooting power, one of the things you want to see is you turn on the system and there's no power. Well, you plugged it in. You've got your power supply in place. You want to first, of course, very common, have you plugged it in? Is it plugged in? Uh, very more, more often than you'd think, things aren't exactly plugged into the wall the way you would expect to see. You've got your multimeter, so you can always check that at the very basic level all the way through. Does your outlet have power? Does it have power into the back of the system? Does that power onto the motherboard? That multimeter comes in really handy. And you want to check your wattage specifications. If you've added another hard drive into your system, you've plugged everything in, you hit the power, and nothing happens, it could be that your power supply isn't rated with enough watts to drive the additional power that that hard drive needs. When you first turn on a system, that is one of the times when it needs the most amount of power. So you'll know pretty quick if your power supply is going to be able to handle it or not. And if it doesn't, you just don't get any power. It's very easy to troubleshoot that scenario. Now, if you have too much power, well, that, that's a much bigger problem. You don't want to have too much power going into your computer system. We, in a very humorous way, often say that smoke is what really makes electronics work. And if the smoke comes out, the electronics don't work anymore. Not exactly true, but you can start to see where this is coming from. If you have too much power, you're going to see some smoke happen in your system, and it's going to destroy the electronics. You want to plan ahead. Have a surge protector in place, a UPS. Make sure you're using the right voltages going into your system. If you go over to Europe, make sure that you've changed your system or that it has a switch and you've converted over to the higher voltage, to 220 volts. You don't want to plug in the wrong way. If you're ever in a situation you're worried about the amount of power coming through, unplug the computer completely. This is a really good idea if you live in a part of the country or part of the world that has a lot of thunderstorms, there's a lot of lightning strikes there, just unplug the computer. There is not a surge suppressor or a UPS designed in the world made today that can handle a direct lightning strike. So you want to completely unplug from the outlet if you ever have any questions about that. You may wonder, how, how would I know that? Well, let me explain to you how I know that. I live in Florida, and I my particular house has had a direct lightning strike. This one came in, interestingly enough, hit a tree, and underneath the tree was a phone line that came into my house. My phone line connected into a number of systems, like my fax machine that was also plugged into power, and the lightning traveled into my power system and then started blowing up other things in my house. The average lightning bolt, 40,000 amps at over a billion volts. There's not a power supply or surge suppressor that can handle that load. And this is what's left of my particular outlet in my garage whenever that volt came through and hit my garage door opener. If you happen to have electronics sitting on your desk that you're using in the middle of a thunderstorm, and fortunately you're not touching at the time, you may have something like this happen. Went right into this laptop and the, the desk that I use has metal underneath the wood and it zapped right into that desk. Fortunately, I wasn't hurt, but the laptop did not survive so well, as you can see. So you can see why it's very important to unplug from that power and how important it is to be very safe when you're working around electricity. In review, you can see that we've gone through a number of tools. Make sure you have your circuit testers and that multimeter avail available. We've do done some troubleshooting on power connections. You should know now exactly how to plug into your outlets, how to plug into your motherboard and start doing some troubleshooting. We've talked about UPS systems and surge suppressors and how you can take advantage of having those. Make sure you have a surge suppressor if you have something electronic in your system and how you can even install and upgrade the power supplies in your computer system. For more information, more free videos, we've got an online forum, a wiki that you can participate in. Visit our website, freeaplus.com.